to our zendo without walls. Or as one longtime student put it, sans frontier, without borders. By the end of the day yesterday, it was the zendo at Mountain Cloud. However deeply grounded and tendered, tended this place. This zendo, this is the zendo, without walls, without ceiling, without floor. The support of the wider sangha, pouring in, supporting us all. all-pervading support. Now the privilege of a second day. As Henry mentioned, today is the eighth day of the twelfth month, Rohatsu, also called Bodhi Day. The day when practitioners around the world celebrate the awakening of Shakyamuni Buddha. Celebrate by sitting as he sat with patience, fortitude, balance, Effortless effort and insight with an eye, the eye, turn to the suffering of the world with empty hands and open hearts with love. It might not feel like that every moment, but we couldn't do it otherwise. The humanity of our practice honors the Buddha and through it in this body, we realize the awakening that is right now. We don't just join it, we are it. That's what this is. That's what this is. Shakyamuni Buddha seeing the morning star realized the way and said, I and all beings and the great earth have simultaneously attained the way. I and the great earth and all beings have simultaneously attained the way. This is the head chapter of the Transmission of Light, or Denkoroku. Chapter Zero. Sometimes the numbering shifts, but we know it as Chapter Zero, this head chapter, the whole circle empty and complete.
empty and complete and endlessly progenitive dynamic. So, of course, details of the story vary. It's such a, it's so powerful, you know, it doesn't really matter. But here is how Master Kazan put it. In 1300, he started writing these talks, giving them to his monks on these 53 cases that are collected here and this transmission of light. He thought they would be helpful to his monks. <coughs> Case, and he, background to the story, his own comments and a verse. How helpful to spend a year doing this. And in the end, it's helpful to us. So, background to case zero. At age 19, Shakyamuni leapt over the palace walls in the dead of night and shaved off his hair. After that, he practiced austerities for six years. Subsequently, he sat on the indestructible seat. So immobile that spiders spun webs in his eyebrows and magpies built a nest on top of his head. Reeds grew up between his legs as he sat tranquilly and erect for six years. This is Kaysan. At the age of 30, on the eighth day of the 12th month, as the morning star appeared, he was suddenly enlightened. I and all beings and the great earth simultaneously attain the way. This, Kazan writes, is his first lion's roar. His lion's roar, right here. You're sitting is that roar. <laughs> the silence of the light in the sendo is that roar. So what happened? What happened? As the story goes, this I sometimes say living koan, this living story, after six years of this unmatched rigor, nobody practiced harder, he said, nearly dying of his austerities, but still unable to push himself off that cliff. <sighs> we know that cliff. He took a seat. The Buddha sat in straightforward ease and unwavering absorption. One night, sitting through the night, just before morning, that last watch, he looked up.
could say the light of his eye met the light of the shining star. That morning star. That star we call Venus. His eye met that light. Just happened to look up. And suddenly, there was just one shining. You know, it seems extra even to say everything fallen, no trace of a boundary. I and the great earth and all beings simultaneously. There is no other way. In a number of versions of this remarkable, pivotal moment, the Buddha also exclaimed, Throughout heaven and earth, I alone. Or in another rendering, I alone am holy. There's no opposite there. This one reality. <laughs> Call it holy. Or like Bodhidharma, no holiness. It's this. Simultaneously, I alone. Shakyamuni Buddha said, I was born. How many times I've heard our abbot, Yamada Rion, say to this case or just to any, this is the greatest discovery in history. This. It's the journey we're on, and it's already so. How do we try even to name it, this oneness world? Vast, empty firmament, no edge, no border, no boundary, cannot be divided. It can't. It can't be divided, and it's coming up right now right here. That's what this is. Each one of us, you could say, is of course included in this. This awakening. This. And each one of us is all of it.
whatever you pick up. Your own heart. All of it. I remember being at our annual Sambo Zen teacher training. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. opportunity. And we had you know, gathered around in this uh, very intimate koan study. I came to this case. How will you present it? This greatest discovery in history. <laughs> so, you know, one by one, my beloved Dharma sisters and brothers were called on and, you know, there were just, just, yes! Or I remember our wonderful French Dharma brother, you know, that he didn't say we, he was just like, <gasps> you know, <laughs> just that, how can you express this? This one body or Dosho Port some time ago gave a, a talk on this. I'm, I'm not sure what year, but I, I remember hearing it and, and he, he just kept, you know, circling around to, oh my God, mm -hmm. oh my God. <laughs> This true human body, nothing excluded. Marvel, wonder, exclamation. And broken hearts, grief, hesitancy. Longing, lack, illness, age, nothing excluded. I remember how uh, Ruben Habito Roshi, our our dear master, my, my root teacher, once gave what he called his last Taisho. He'd gotten the news that a, a real dear friend was dying imminently, you know, some weeks. So he said, you know, what if this is my last Taisho? And then it is my last. And he laid out the ABCs of Zen. This is what I would say. This is about B. Absolute belonging. No exception. There's just there, there's just no way way to cut it. Henry's been calling this original love, this tradition, your original face. This love with no opposite. Simultaneously. I alone. There's a bit in Kazan's Teisho to this where he goes after that I. He writes, the so-called I in this case is not Shakyamuni Buddha. I is one existence 
Even Shakyamuni Buddha himself comes from this I, Kazan says. Not only does Shakyamuni come from it, but the great earth and all beings also come from it. Ryo and Roshi respectfully disagrees. Mm -hmm. Actually, he said, even that is not precise enough. How? How can we clearly express this world? It is not coming from something. This one Uh, entirety, existence, fabric, you. Great earth, all beings. I've heard him say again and again, even simultaneously isn't clear enough. There's just one. Just one. Each and everything, that's it. And this is it. So Kazan uses this image that is so familiar to many of us, the net of Indra, you know, trying to convey this, this each being is all of it, this you alone, this net, the single fabric of our existence, this intricately interwoven net, and in the net, you know, at that intersection, at that juncture, is each one of us alone, a gem, a jewel, reflecting every other and receiving the reflection of every other gem. That level of support. When the net is raised, writes Kazan, all the many openings of the net are also raised. Just like this, when Shakyamuni Buddha realized the way, the great earth and all beings also realized the way. Uh, tripped over that also. Not just the great earth and all beings, but all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. So here he gets into this. You know, it's not just all beings, all existence, also all time. This awakening, this now. There's nothing like the past tense. It doesn't hold up. There's nothing like the future. Or if there's anything like that, it is now. Realizing us. Simultaneously is now. I was touched this time reading this story by the role of Mara. Mara is a demon representing desire, all of its ramifications, that demon of our own inner critic, you could say, that one student so evocatively called the separator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that somehow updates it. You know, Mara right here, the separator. 
The name means death or destruction, you know, identified with delusion. So Gautama, Siddhartha Gautama, sits through the night. You know, in this utter absorption. Even, even that sounds like something extra. He sits. And Mara sends a whole range of human lures or temptations and also foils to drive away the immense support that's showing up, that's flocking to his side to help birth this discovery, this greatest discovery. Finally, Mara issues the challenge. What license do you have to sit under the Bodhi tree? This strong trunk supporting you, these, the wide shade the atomic seat. <laughs> How can you attest to your value? Who witnesses your right to the seat of awakening? I hear that question a lot. By what right am I here? Buddha just reaches down, touches the earth, this earth. It says, the earth is my witness. W.S. Merwin, that, Merwin, that you know, Pulitzer Prize-winning poet laureate, Zen practitioner, wrote, the Buddha reaches down and with his finger touches the earth. He says, the earth is my witness. And Merwin adds, he said, Mara, you are not the earth. The earth is right here beneath my finger, and the earth the earth is what we're talking about. The whole earth, your whole body. Some years ago, I was in a six or seven day retreat a session at home in Dallas a couple years into my practice you know having had just you know that that taste that glimpse that can launch a steady deep koan practice and I'm sitting in the zendo a couple days into this retreat and suddenly just what seemed like out of nowhere beset by a very dark memory just saturated in it I wanted to run out of the zendo screaming that would have been well, best not to run out screaming, but okay to leave. Okay to leave, okay to go for a walk, okay to weep, you know, find that place. Um, tend, care. Somehow in this moment, there was some instinct that asked, 
just to stay there. Don't have to do anything. Just stay. That's all I could do. The earth is my witness. Uh, I briefly want to share something with you that that I didn't know about that came as a uh, kind of an important something to uh, look into. Clark Strand, this wonderful uh, former, he was a, a Zen monk, and now he's a writer, scholar, poet. Um, he has collected, uh, I'm not sure, maybe it's 53. Anyway, a, a collection of koans. He calls the green koans. And this is case one. He doesn't usurp that zero. He just starts with one. Shakyamuni touches the earth. He writes, as Shakyamuni meditated beneath the Bodhi tree, Mara pointed to the place where he sat and demanded, who witnesses your right to the seed of enlightenment? Shakyamuni reached a finger down to touch the ground. I call the earth as my witness. So Strand, in his commentary about the earth, writes, this isn't about the Buddha having his enlightenment confirmed from without. As Strand puts it, it's an equal sign. Reaching down, touching. I really am so grateful and want to explore this. But it's not even equal. There's no equation. That finger, that bone, that is the earth the great earth and all beings. Would that we could see this. We can, we can. See it and know it in our bones. Oh, I'm gonna end this soon, it's going on, but I, I came across a phrase uh, also to explore for, for me uh, about this inner certainty. That's something recognizable there. That we have this somehow, this, you know, in this way, as Henry put it, the way of not knowing. You know, yet, somehow, there's this inner certainty that, you know, puts us here. And what about the combustion of that inner certainty with this not knowing? This earth is my body with all its thirst, its loss, its impulse to survive, and with its multitudinous array of support. Inexhaustible. Whatever the burden, there's no carrying it alone. No need to carry. This whole body. Strand adds this verse at the end. Sentient beings have two choices, 
up or down. Buddhas have only one. Try as you like. You'll never toss a stone out of this world. You can't. So this practice, it's an invitation to let go release our hold on up or down, those choices, this or that, release whatever is extra. Let it go. Let it go and rest, just in this here and now. Might, might seem like, how could I possibly rest in this? That's what this is, this rest. Become the breath, become mu, become the moment at hand with no remainder. You could say, let it all go and then look up. So I'd just like to close with Kazan's two line verse pointing to this world to be discovered, explored, and lived for the sake of the whole body. Here's the verse. A branch shoots forth wonderfully, the old plum tree, in the course of time, Thorns and prickles become attached to it. This old plum tree. Of course, ancient beyond measure and utterly new. A single branch shooting forth. I suddenly hear Reuben saying, the infinite horizon. Infinite and always moving. In the course of time, thorns and prickles become attached to it. This empty horizon, this bright blue sky, nothing at all. And yet, here we are. Sitting, listening, also maybe body aching, maybe struggling, maybe caught in concepts. Kazan calls it thorns and prickles, each one whole and in full bloom. Thank you so much for this shared practice. Thank you.
सना